Good evening, and welcome to this conversation with Shazia Sikander. From the moment I saw her first paintings, I became an ardent admirer. Her work, which grows out of a deep interest in Indian and Islamic illustrated manuscripts, often referred to as miniature painting because of their small size, extends and expands this important tradition in new and imaginative ways. As a student of 16th and 17th century Indian and Iranian illustrated manuscripts, I immediately responded to how Shazia had revived and reinvigorated this long neglected way of making art. As a graduate student, then as a curator, I was particularly interested in the performative nature of miniature painting, by which I mean the way artists were required to know and observe certain sets of rules and practices in order to demonstrate their ability but at the same time, they were expected to add their own flourishes. The greatest of them were both impresarios, mustering the talents of dozens of people in their workshops, and soloists, capable of adding touches that no one else could. After years of careful study, Shazia has understood the nature of this tradition, this material, and her ability to use it in new and unexpected ways. Over her now 30-year career, she has dealt with issues of gender and identity, terrorism and the environment, racism and statehood, among many topics. So Shazi and I will talk for about 40 minutes, then turn to all of you for questions. If you'd like to ask a question, please do, th do so through the chat function in Zoom. Conversation is being recorded and you can return to it through the gallery's website. And a gentle reminder, Shazi will also be in conversation with Julie Meritu and Gayatri Gopina, on July 19th at 6 p.m. You can access that through the Morgan uh, Library's YouTube page. And again, on July 27th at 5 p.m. Is that right, Shazia, 5 p.m. or 6 p.m.? In any event, five, uh, Shazia will be in conversation with Roya Hakian uh, and Vishaka Desai. That'll also be through the Morgan site. So Shazia, let me begin with a question for you. There's a beautiful line in the opening of your new children's book, Roots and Wings, that you wrote with Amy Noveski, where you say, and this has really resonated with me, a girl steps into a painting, opens a door, enters a world, roams from room to room, a whole family lives there. What did you mean by that? You know, that idea of the whole family or like the entire world that lives in in the in the work itself in one's head <laughs> in one space i think that particular um outlook is very much at the core of how i work how i think of myself very much like a detective that is engaged in the archives and every time you know i'm i am looking at historical material and have the opportunity to look at the provenance, it opens a, an entire world that, that is um, not familiar or hasn't yet been understood in terms of its colonial legacy. So, so you know, that brings me to this sort of um, question that I wanna pose you is that there was this recent article in New York Times uh, by Jason Farago uh, and it kind of, it, it, it uh, I know it, uh, upset it quite a lot of people in the um, in the historical uh, Indian arts historical his art historians as well as some of the people that the piece was basically very orientalist and um, and I I also was able to respond to it not if directly but I I did write a piece in New York Times um, a little bit later. And so for a lot of people that are listening in, you can always read that. But so I, I thought I would start there, Glenn, and see, because you have a background, you have a history as an Islamicist and you know, I, I, your work from the 80s, 90s. So I wondered what you thought of this happening at this time and place. It's a great question, Shazi. I mean, of course, I was delighted that Jason was looking at a tradition that I think is so important, uh, mogul painting, uh, a tradition that brings together uh, works of art that are deeply infused with a sense of place and meaning, India in the 16th and 17th century, one of the most fascinating places in the world, and where the Mughals as, a, as an empire brought together 
artists uh, and ideas from not just the Muslim world and not just India, but from Europe and elsewhere. Uh, and, and of course, it's impossible to look at a, at a painting like that today without being conscious of the full impact of colonialism uh, and Orientalism as a means by which so many of these works of art were transferred from India and Iran and elsewhere to collections in the West. Uh, that is embedded today uh, in their meaning. But I think it's still possible to look at them carefully, to see them, and this is what, what, I, what, I, what I take away from the way you approach the question I asked you, to see them as a window into a world. Uh, these are largely narrative images. They, they seek to tell a story. Uh, and if we are attentive and we do the hard work, we can learn that we can learn from these works of art. And they and, and, and what I what I thought was important about Jason was that he was trying hard to encourage people to look carefully, uh, to quote, read these paintings intelligently. Uh, and of course, and to do that, you have to be aware of their history, both as an object made at a certain time in a certain place but also as an object that acquired importance and value in another time and in a very different place. And I think your work excites me because it unpacks both of those issues uh, in a meaningful way. Well, you know, what I would like to say is that it would have been, it's a great uh, premise to be sharing so much of this um, genre, of course, on a platform like New York Times, but there are many incredible scholars that, that somebody that has the scholarship could have been given the opportunity also. A perspective that, that informs, you know, comes from that, that manner has a very different sort of um, lens than uh, somebody who doesn't necessarily know that tradition is going to engage in it or present it. That isn't, isn't, isn't that, important like who gets to tell the history who gets to narrate whose perspective those hi hierarchies are about power so uh that's that's how i felt like you know we are talking about power and beauty but we're also not talking about the uh privilege and and the patterns of power that have existed in a very eurocentric art world, which continues to happen. Even, even in my own experience, so much of the work that I've made in the last 30 years, you know, it still gets to be seen from a little bit from outside of the art world because it happens, because we, we, we just have to, we, we are born into a very Eurocentric art world. <laughs> and, and, and that's another thread that, you know, definitely I wanna address today with you because you have this very interesting history with this knowledge of, um, of uh, Indian manuscript painting, but at the same time, you're the director of, of MoMA and, and how some of that sort of, how do you, did that influence? Like how does that um, open up um, representation or inclusion of artists that are not necessarily from the West or that are not engaged in art history that's in, in languages that sit in the center of Western, Western canon? Well, I think I, I occupy, if not a unique, a rare position in that I come to art largely through the study of another culture, not my own. Uh, and with that comes a tremendous admiration and respect for the extraordinary creativity and traditions and histories of other people and other places. And I hope that what I bring to the Museum of Modern Art is a recognition that there are many different histories and many different modernities that are at play and even in contest with each other at any given moment. Uh, and that the absolutism of a quote, Eurocentric modernist narrative may have been a viable idea 50 years ago, but it is absolutely not a viable idea today. And that we have to recognize that different people with different voices, different issues and different ideas have equally interesting histories that need to be understood, discussed, debated and appreciated on their terms, not on our terms. Uh, and that there's a lot of room 
in a place like the Museum of Modern Art to enable that to happen. Uh, and so we've tried to expand uh, the range of voices, both who are present in the collection, but are also present on our curatorial staff and elsewhere in the museum, because you need that plurality of voices to approach anything like a deep understanding of, of, a, of a tradition. And I don't wanna harp on Jason because I'm enough of a proselytizer that I'm happy that anytime someone from a European or North American tradition is interested enough in looking at a work of art from the Mughal period, even if they don't understand it or fail to fully understand it, they're at least interested enough to be thinking about it. And for me, that's always a toehold to begin a conversation with them that might go deeper and, and, and help them recognize that their initial reading was a superficial reading and that there are more and, and deeper understandings that are available if you just talk to the right people, spend the time looking and thinking. I no, I totally appreciate you know this conversation that we're having. Having thank you for that too for the acknowledgement as well. I um, I do want to say that you know even um, in my experience, and I've lived here now more than uh, more more than half of my life has been in the U.S. And still, I feel like there's an incredible resistance to the work that I've been making in the US that has also had an impact on American art, but it continues to be seen through the lens of biography of where I'm from, where I came from, like those uh, framing uh, elements never disappear. And, and, I'm, and I'm curious to know, uh, to find out like what else needs to happen, of course, you know, more, it's not just the scholarship, but it's like people in positions of power that do not want, they like this idea of an expanding art world, but they also do not want to stretch their language. They don't, they don't want to, to engage in a language that allows participation beyond just what the art market is saying. So that's, that's something that I feel Kind of very critical to to the nature to the to the germ of like uh, of how how you know an artist like myself is looking at tradition, but doesn't mean that I'm a traditional artist. And even that in itself, like, what do we mean when we're talking about who gets to um, uh, be seen from you know uh, from outside of those uh, in these very polarizing, opaque ways? Well, of course, that's an inherent problem, right? I mean, this isn't unique to you, Shazia. This is the, the, this is the dilemma of the Eurocentric tradition that has always seen power in a very narrow way. Uh, but I think there's a lot of space for someone like you to make your own room. And part of that comes from the ardent lobbying that you have to do through your work to help people understand that you are an individual with your own history, with your own set of concerns, uh, that you are not a Muslim woman from Pakistan and therefore your art has to be seen only through that, that lens. Uh, you come with a lot of different experiences. But the reality is the, the art world always likes to categorize what it's looking like and frame it in convenient, uh, in convenient easily digestible ways. Uh, that, that, you know, that's what we collectively have to work against. Yeah. And I think for that, it's very important to sort of uh, fill the gaps. It's not just, you know, what is hot and contemporary is always going to be, um, that's current. It's what I think placing um, historically significant movements that have occurred beyond um, the last decade and two or three or four, you know, things that were happening in the 1930s and the 40s and the 50s outside of the West as well. How does the museum allow space for that, for those types of conversations? So I, I totally understand, but I, I quickly wanna, before I move on to these, I do want to make a point that Glenn, when I uh, 
started looking at these traditions, right? So I, I did not have this access that I could actually physically see the real objects. This is the access I had, which was catalogs by, you, by yourself. This one from the 19, I think 86. I had, I had seen that in Pakistan. Then uh, Howard Hodgkin's uh, collection of Indian art, which was, I think, on the market recently, right? So that particular book. And, to, and this is how you would see something versus this is how, if you see it in flesh, it is, right? So that, that's, I think, a very important idea think to for people to understand that when uh, you are being seen as an artist that is engaged in a cultural language, like whose culture are we talking about? It, you know, that essentialization needs to end. <laughs> it's going on forever and ever. And, uh, and also in terms of the terms itself, like miniature painting is a very, uh, it, it, it is a colonial problematic term. And then, and then to be, you know, to be able to sort of see things, of course, there's so much range and a range in language, range in provenance, so uh, things that that speak to me. But early on, you know, I when I was working with my teacher Bashir Ahmed in Pakistan in the in 87, 88, copies that I made. I did not have access even to the real color. So, so one would just perhaps look at black and white Xeroxes. Some of the earlier things are in this show at the Morgan, organized by, uh, curated by the RISD Museum. And uh, then I was looking through your book and I saw this image. It's actually in there. And some of the exercises from that early era where you would learn how to play with ink and how to control your hand and how to sort of, you know, understand the stylization that that's inherent in this language. Some of these early works, yeah, like even the graphite, controlling the graphite to such incredible um, detail and intimacy. So, uh, so sharing a, a little bit of the early exercises, but then I started making newer compositions. So these are, unfortunately, I was unable to bring this work from Pakistan, but I also lived in uh, Somalia, Mogadishu in 1982. So these are very early kind of compositions, which my attempt to kind of create, um, uh, not appropriate the tradition, but to sort of um, make new compositions, uh, early on when I was a teenager. So that, that kind of brings to this particular work, the scroll that the children's book also uses as a lens to tell my story. And, um, and this particular work was, of course, a lot has been said and written about. It was a rupture, so to speak, in Pakistan in 1989 and opens up uh, the possibilities for a younger generation to engage in a language which is not necessarily at that time um, even popular in India. There's a tourist market going on and there are ateliers and schools in practicing miniature painting, but not in any real contemporary manner. And then how to understand what is contemporary or the possibility of its uh, overlapping into a contemporary space. So. So this, this, this is uh, definitely that, that moment in time and history where um, I'm looking at the Safavid tradition, but I'm also looking at Hockney's uh, Polaroid photos, uh, Chinese scroll painting, Subramanian's work, uh, even like um, films, structure narrative of Satyajit Ray, um, uh, they, they, there's, variety of of influences to think of it as like this um poem or a epic poem and um and then you know keep the the female agency becomes very uh, much uh something a theme which was a very vague which was a very abstract theme to to explore not like identity in in a thematic way but to um the, to, to sort of the ambiguity of youth 
at a time when there's the Al Haqsa regime in the background, there's the Soviet, Afghan, Pak, US war unfolding. Culture is dramatically changing from how open it was for my gen parents' generation and how inward it's becoming like those cycles. So, so a lot of this work kind of, uh, now when I look at it, it's not a literal representation of a home and my home or a room, but it's, it's wider, it's, uh, it's sorry about that. Um, so yeah, so there you can see the examples. There's something I think very interesting in the scroll, which I spent a lot of time looking at over the last week. Um, and for those of you who haven't seen the exhibition, I urge you uh, to go and see it because it's an incredible opportunity to see works that are otherwise quite hard to get to. But in the scroll, you're already disappearing, right? There's a dimension of you that's already moving away, that you're never, we never really see you face on. We see you wandering through the scroll, but I, I, I have this sense of you almost uh, dissolving. It's as if you're anticipating some dramatic change, that the, the, the scroll is both an affirmation and a confirmation of your art making. And, and it feels to me a, a, a kind of statement about the change that's going to happen to you, uh, that there's an anticipatory dimension to it as much as a kind of proclamation that I've learned how to do this and I'm, I'm ready to graduate uh, from, from school. Yeah, absolutely. I think the that process of acquiring language, you know, I, that that was my approach. I was like, it, for me, it's very mathematical. It's incredibly pragmatic at the same time that the, my interest in understanding a very truncated um, genre, which is not available to me, they made the handful of of Kangra paintings in the Lahore Art Museum next door. Of course, you can go see them, but you don't get a sense of, of the vastness of the South Central Asian all the way into Eastern Europe and China. And like, how do you get the, at, at a pre-internet, you know, uh, um, at a time when there would be just a handful of museum catalogs also printed by, Western institutions like the British Library or, or the British Museum or the VNA. So <coughs> that framing is already a very frustrating idea. And then at the same time, how do you uh, well, how do you how how do you engage in that language? So I was I, I was it's not just a training by a master or this idea of like you're learning a craft and all these ancient languages. I think in the 90s a lot many times that essentialist reading onto my work was also problematic because it focused on squirrel hair brushes or it focused on you know um, ancient techniques. One was working with watercolor. <laughs> one was still working with gouache. And one, it, so these are things that tend to, how do you disassociate? How do you untangle this mentality in the art world that kind of tends to, to still continues to do that, if in, not in those exact ways, but definitely in terms of nationhood, in terms of a nationalistic uh, narrative or rhetoric. So here, I think how I, what happened was that there, there was a it was a rupture. I was on, I got a lot of attention. It opened up the doors. It definitely was a moment which was very liberating and exciting. I started to teach right away with Bashir Ahmed, and I'm still very young. I'm barely like I think 20, 21, and at that time, I was also acutely aware that I didn't want to be consumed by the academic politics. I, I had to grow as an artist and I was excited at the possibilities that maybe I would be able to go study in India, maybe meet some of the Baroda artists, or maybe I could, you know, have some distance and, and go see some actual works in London, in, in the British Library, British Museum, how, and how could I do that? And I think that's sort of a very exciting journey that uh, this exhibition and the accompanying book 
uh, they they elaborate all of these um, um, this time frame from the perspective of other authors and artists that knew me, as well as uh, from both the perspective of not just within the U.S. but outside of the U.S. So that I appreciated tremendously that um, Dennis Congdon went to Pakistan, met with uh, Bashir, and you know the discussions that ensued are all represented here, which is very different from an artist that has to always tell their story themselves all the time. So, so that that shift I think is very exciting for me in this moment, and even in the last week that the show has opened, so many young kids that have come that are you know, in their 20s on thinking about graduate school and, and then they're, they, they can, they are appreciating the work or they can relate to it, but they're forgetting that the work was made 30 years ago. And that happens so many times. If you look at Zarina Hashmi's work, she gets acknowledged in her 70s or maybe just around then, right? And then a lot of her work that we get to see was work that she was making in the 1970s. So why, why that tends to happen for such so many, it happens for women artists for sure, but for South Asian women artists or women of color, it's another incredibly problematic thing. Like, you know, you have to tell your story, not just once, you have to keep telling it again and again. So for me to be telling my story right now in 2021, a story that, <laughs> played out in the US in 1993. That's a lot of burden to carry. So, so that's where I was like, you know, what, what institutions can play a role, a more active role? How can MoMA play a more active role in giving space and language to, um, to many artists like myself? But you had, I think, early on, and, and certainly continued success. I mean, you didn't, you, you came out of RISD, you, you arrived um, in Houston and then New York. You, you had, you know, I, I certainly enough recognition that many of us saw your work, became interested in it, got a chance to know you, you participated uh, in many exhibitions. So of course you're fighting against all sorts of barriers that need to be uh, dismantled, but you also weren't, you weren't invisible. Uh, you may not have been uh, as visible as you wanted, but do you feel that you were actually invisible during this time? Not, uh, uh, Glenn, I, 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 under, I hear that. Like there's a tension that comes often for women in particular early on. And then there's a huge lack of, of support in mid-career for many, many people. And then of course, for many artists, you don't even get that attention and maybe they, you get discovered you know, very late in, you know, in, your, in your career. So those patterns, obviously they, we all are aware of them. They do exist. They unfortunately exist so much more for, for women. And um, so, it, so it's not this idea of visibility. I think being an Asian, Asian American, in, in America right now is basically about that, the paradox that you are just so hyper visible and at the same time, incredibly invisible. No, and, I think, and, yeah, I think you got that exactly right. Uh, and, and that is the dilemma of this very moment where so much is misunderstood and there is a desire to try and grapple with recent histories and recent, recent um, uh, issues that were overlooked or misunderstood. And yet at the same time, in doing that very thing, we create another set of dilemmas and problems that, that erase the texture that is so important in, 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 in your work, not just in your work, but in you as a person, you as a living being. Uh, who, who comes with issues and ideas and concerns that are essential to understanding both who you are and the work you're doing. And I wanted to ask you in that context, uh, how the impact of your time in Houston, uh, and certainly with Rick Blow and Project Row House, because as I was reading the catalog, it really struck me 
that that was perhaps a transformative moment for you when you really began to see America through a different lens and perhaps clarify some of your own thinking about the work you wanted to do? Um, of course, that I'm, I moved to Texas. I moved to Houston after uh, finishing the graduate program. So in any case, you know, that is a very um, important time for any artist. You're, you're gonna be, you're in school and then you exit out. Who is your community? Which sort of, you know, who's the audience? How are you gonna make a living and make art and all of that? So, so it's the timing as such. And of course, moving to Texas was also because I was gonna do the core program at the Glassell School with the Museum of Fine Art. So that had just, uh, it had, it was in its beginning uh, years and, and there was a little bit of a, a reputation that it was a, a rigorous program and to go there. So it's, it's, a, it's a combination of all of those things that you get another two years to keep making work and then it happens to give me the opportunity to see the, um, the differences in the North and South of the, of the country and what that type of kind of Texas with Houston in particular, multiple uh, immigrant narratives that are unfolding there. And at the same time, they are various silos of race and representations and, you know, and, and what, what I think is the, most uh, interesting overlap is that I came to art from a background in uh, mathematics, English literature, economics, and, and I, I went in the direction of art because I was inspired by a lot of women around me, human rights activists, women that were, um, you know, finding ways of dissent and countering not just patriarchal systems, but larger systems, war, economy, you know, capitalist structures. So my, I was, I gravitated to all of that. And that crossroad of community and art was my first encounter and interest in going to the National College of Arts. So of course that, that parallel I see unfolding in, in the row houses in the third ward at that time. And, and that I think is, um, is, is definitely allows me to uh, kind of feel and sense that, okay, you know, what, how exciting a different type of a African-American uh, interest in storytelling is different. It, it's tapping into a very different sort of histories of uh, civil rights movements of uh, music and jazz and, all of these ingredients that you know that one gets to to experience and understand, and that's a time when a lot of uh, African American artists in the nation, I think, had were exhibiting there. So I, I remember meeting many, many, many um, artists. So that's when I start thinking of the overlapping diasporas. But just around that time, I'm interested in forms like this, you know. So I was looking at representations in in catalogs again, very much like the ones that were coming have come out over the years early on uh, about very broad categories of Islamic art or Indian art, and these shadowless sort of representations in there that do not give you an understanding of its colonial sort of violence and legacy that, that they have been subjected to. So I was like, okay, these are little monsters. And what if I imagine them as such that they step outside of their confines and um, categorizations into something beyond what would happen? So I start thinking of language through those lenses and, and that kind of starts to give me tools to to think of forms which are almost kind of uh, engage the feminine body, but they are, but they, but their sources are not necessarily the female form, and and that sort of kind of um, emergence of that lexicon allows me to um, kind of run with them and speak uh, and almost sort of bring them into the space of the manuscript and then take that whole uh, armature onto walls and installations. So I'm kind of like 
interested in that tension that would happen by placing things that are not comfortable in their own skin or space. So th that type of, um, of dismantling of sorts and pushing forms and thinking of form in its own time and space, what it meant. So some of these works um, speak to that. Um, this idea of maybe the uprootedness, but the uprootedness is also becoming the apparatus of power. And how, what is the uprootedness here is basically the trope of Radha Krishna where I've removed all the male ass elements. So, and then I was like, okay, if I, if I exit the male, what starts to happen? But I was also interested in, you know, exiting a lot of the, a, a lot of the narrative or the frameworks that had informed um, a lay person like myself looking into these uh, histories to understand, okay, do I need to read the short descriptive paragraph and then see the work or can I just dive right into the work and imagine it as I want to imagine. So that liberty that I take is, uh, is very instrumental in, in sustaining me over the years. But you seem what, what oh, strikes me is so interesting in the way you just describe the, the, the role of the imagination is the way in which you can take all of these different uh, vocabularies and all of these different issues and let them kind of bleed into each other. I don't want to use the word surrealist, but there is a kind of new imaginary that you're creating. And, and it's particularly intense because of scale, right? By, by, there's something that happens when you work in the format of an illustrated manuscript that intensifies the issues and ideas precisely because they're being uh, compressed in scale and compressed in space. And I, and I think that's one of the reasons that these works are so vibrant is the way in which the narratives start um, coalescing and coruscating one upon the other. And I love the way, for instance, you introduce these circles as a kind of purely formal device, but they're a formal device that animates the story now. It's your, your, you're creating a new trope inside a set of existing tropes. Sure. And there's a definitely, a, they, it's a, it, but it was also a very modernist element. And then in the first instances that I started to bring, say, just for the sake of our point here, bringing the circle onto my painting, it was wherever the circle would land, it would erase the, the detail behind it. So I, it was, for me, it was almost like a, um, a, a it was subtractive labor. I was playing with multiple ideas. It was all, and then I was also thinking bullet holes. I, 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 I was thinking the globe. I was thinking many ways. So, so each element would had a very uh, specific function and reason. And I think a lot, many times there's, I see a lot of wit in the paintings. Even if you look at the top, like where the female figure has transformed in, into that turtle that's flying off, you know, even in terms of like, uh, titles like then and now, you know, now would be the National Organization of Women, but that too is a very, uh, from the, it's a very white feminist experience of feminism. This is a time when um, you couldn't find uh, yourself in that space because it was very opaque and homogenous, like third world feminism. That's a, a lot of the early art history books, Lucy Lepard, like they, they still dealt with such opaque categories. And it's not, you know, one is old, but it's not that long time ago, but so much of that uh, language has, uh, has sort of failed artists like myself that work in the West, right? So that's the other thing is like, you are, I'm making my work in the West. As you mentioned, it got attention. in proximity to everybody. But I also experienced that to legitimate, le legitimize my story, people would have wanted to go, go to Pakistan and, and hear the story from there. Why don't they trust the uh, American, Asian American experience that's unfolding here in front? 
And I think that's true when so many artists operate in Queens, how much, how many of those artists got attention? So, you know, the, some, all of this becomes fodder for me in my work. And much of these paintings basically engage um, with, with the community, with, with some of the themes that are uh, talking about that moment in time in the mid 90s and the late 90s and the early 2000s, of course, post 9-11. So it's, it's always in conversation with its uh, immediate uh, political, um, you know, uh, conversations that are unfolding, but it's open-ended and it's full of, I, 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 for me, it's always like, I was, um, I, I think of the work that it was de uh, decolonizing, deconstructing, decolonizing, but in a, in a, in a playful way, even the dislocation was pleasing. It wasn't like, you know, I, I have, I, I'm a visual artist. I want to leave some mystery intact. I want people to experience the work in a very visceral way as well. So, so that, that for me is very important that uh, the, 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 the language of painting is as important an experience and a window into the work. So it's not just, um, um, you know, um, what's happening inside the painting, but that, that balance has always been off because even if, if even now in, in putting this show together, so much of the earlier books that have been written about, it's amazing. It's like that same uh, two paragraphs that have been cut and pasted for 15 years <laughs> that kind of put you, straight jacket you in terms of your biography. And, um, and, and, and I think the book definitely uh, opens that conversation up in, in, in fresh ways and exciting ways. So, so these, are, these, are, these are some of those early works where the work sort of expands and you, you know, yeah, I, I started doing wall drawings and then wall drawings became uh, some large scale paintings. So this back and forth that continues to happen in the work is, uh, is happening primarily to um, counter binaries that, that, that are so deeply entrenched in, you know, they are still there, the East West, Islamic Western, Asian white, oppressive free. I don't think some of those things have, have dissipated. Remember the show we did, uh, there was a show that it, MoMA did uh, in 2005 or so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, those, those binaries are around for a very, have been around for a very long time and, and they're not going to change quickly even though they need to. I wanna make sure that everyone who is with us has an opportunity to ask questions of you, Shazia. So if you have a question, put it in the chat and I will, pose it uh, to Shazia and we'll continue talking, but don't be shy. Um, let us know what's on your mind so that we can address it. I, I, you know, I wanna come back to this sense of being an Asian American and being an Asian woman in America, South Asian woman uh, in America. I know that you know, this is a moment when there's a lot of anxiety and tension uh, and a lot of hatred that's being uh, unleashed uh, how do you, you know, how do you, how do you navigate that? How do you, and how does that appear in your work? How do you, how do you translate these tensions and um, really, in many cases, ugly forms of racism? How, how do you address that in your work? You know, I think, Glenn, my work has been addressing it for so many years. Like right now, the opportunity to have that work be visible in a very beautiful, um, wonderful institution like the Morgan. It's very central, like e even like the last few days, the amount of people that have come through to see the exhibition, it speaks to the moment. I have never seen this, it's full of South, it's full of Asians. There's been a lot of people that are, um, uh, that are coming and seeing the work and relating to it or, or finding like a, a moment of uh, where, the, where it's not just recognizing themselves in it, but 
obviously I think to, to it's very encouraging to see an Asian American, Asian female artist work on display at, at, a, at an institution like Morgan that hasn't really shown many women artists. So, and of course it has a very deep rooted Western uh, canon that, that, it, uh, that exists in its uh, archives. So, so just, that, just that gesture, just that this moment is very uplifting and significant for, for many younger artists, for sure. I, I've heard that a lot by people, but I think in terms of, of, of the privilege that one has as, a, as an artist, one is very buffered than you know, how, what might be the experience of people working in other, other spaces, in other fields, in, in like look, look exactly what happened to the cab drivers in New York. So many are from South Asia. So, you know, when we're talking about, uh, about all of these dynamics that kind of rotate around race and gender, we are also, we have, it's uh, so much of it is about uh, the class uh, structures in New York City as well. So I, I, I just hope that, you know, conversations will open where, and I, I, I see it, there's much younger South Asian writers that are interested in the work. Uh, points of references are very vast. You know, in the 90s, it was uh, Sara Soleri and Salman Rushdie, right? Of course, those are important voices, but like the world opened up very dramatically uh, too. So, so all of that, I think, I feed off of, of all of that, like that, that's kind of, you know, percolating in my consciousness. And um, if, if I can share that, it's always very um, important how to uh, let people outside of the art world also sort of come in and contribute to, to how the work is going to be understood and seen and, and just quickly, this, uh, this, you know, I, I created this piece here at the Morgan Museum, but it was almost um, sharing, you know, a kind of a time and process that I used to do in the 90s where I would, it was very performative. It was work made in public in front of many people um, tapping into a very different rigor and uh, thinking where you had to think fast and, and, uh, and almost like a mural, but kind of, you know, with different language and paper and ink being kind of almost like a thinking tool. And, um, and, and the curators wanted to show a little bit of that 90s work. And I, I, it was never, it was always very ephemeral. So there was never kind of saved projects that I had made in large scale amounts. So it was more like, okay, I will, respond to it on site and create it. So I, I've always kind of let that, you know, happen. Like I've explored languages, but let the vulnerability um, be present in how I open up doors and how I can think of how, you know, language is important. Like the porosity is for me is very important. But I also wanted to, one more thing before I forget, I wanted to say is that though the work is very much driven by drawing and of course, uh, even the sculpture here, but the sculpture comes, I, I actually, the idea was uh, placed in the work many years ago. So in that sense, you know, there's a cyclical nature. Like one is not just, just the artist, one is almost like a art historian too. So, uh, so that way of like how the language goes in and out and it's not like, oh, you know, it's not always like, a, oh, I'm doing something different. I think that question I often get, oh, like, why do you work in so many languages? I don't think you would be asking Kentridge that, would you? <laughs> so, you know, these are things that you encounter all the time that you're supposed to live in, in, your, in a boxed space. And that's where, you know, that's what we expect a South Asian artist to exist in. And, uh, and, 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 and that I think is, uh, is what I, I was very appreciative today that I would have this opportunity to speak with you about. 
So let, let me pose a, a question to you, which is, you know, and it's a painful chapter in your life, I know this. So we talked about how complicated it is to gain both visibility and presence in America and the dilemma of being a South Asian uh, here, a female South Asian. But I know that in Pakistan, where after all you began your career, where you re-energized uh, a whole school, uh, that there was an effort to erase you from that history as well. Absolutely. Uh, uh, and so you were kind of caught in between, right? Not, not, not fully visible and present in one place uh, and being erased from another place. Um, and clearly there's a, it just means that your work is very complicated and doesn't lend itself to being located, right? It, the very fact that it can be um, re, reimagined in one place and, and not so much forgotten, but literally um, excised from that history uh, is central to your story. And the, and the efforts you've made to, to become present again in Pakistan. Uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of gendered aspects to that if we were to unpack it. But I think I would also say that uh, my work, I have mentored people, you know, outside of the tradition, like Salman Tour, for example. So there's not just one aspect to a youngish contemporary art coming out of Pakistan. It's not just, you know, it's not just through the miniature. It's not just through this one and that there are many, there are many more languages. And I think over time, people will connect the dots and see that the that there is something else that ha that fuels this incredible sort of um, outburst of creativity coming out of Pakistan by a lot of Pakistani women and uh, and and of course I think we all understand that the reasons why artists get erased etc is uh, is there's so much more politics it's always it's a very political stance behind it. And it happens in many art worlds, especially, you know, they, they, there is a little bit of a mafia-esque <laughs> aspect to the art world always. Power dynamics are very uh, prevalent. And, um, and of course, I think as, as, as in the process of this exhibition too, in conversation with so many people, the editors too, it, it comes out. Even my conversation with Vasif Kortun that you know, things get corrected over time in history. So I feel incredibly uh, blessed at this moment that I've had this great exhibition that focuses on this very important uh, 15 years of my practice, but there's a wonderful book also that allows a conversation around the work from so many different perspectives. So there's a question from an anonymous attendee that's sort of apt in the moment, which is, what advice do you have for South Asian artists making work in the U.S.? In the U.S.? U.S. Yeah, I, 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 I you know, when I sort of felt a little bit um, affected by the art world in the sense that, of course, the attention part is fantastic, but then the attention is almost like it um, homogenizes you, you know, because then it wants you to just go sit in your corner and keep churning out the miniatures. And I was not interested in putting up like a sweatshop model of art making. I make the work. So it was also like, okay, these are important topics. Nobody dares to talk about them. Every time I have brought them up, you get punished. So that's the other thing that I think is really important is to have honest conversations, to have brave conversations, to um, understand that, you know, if there's very little representation in a very white art world, then maybe the literary world is expanding in a very different manner. I, I engage with a lot of authors, with a lot of poets, it's, uh, it, it sustains me, it allows me to, to um, keep the conversations valid and going. And, and of course my language is, is drawing, but it's very much a thinking tool. So that, that would be my advice is that you have yeah. to really work hard to understand who your community is and, and kind of you know, strengthen that. And it need not just be 
um, from one language. It can be multiple languages. I'm just looking through um, to see if there are questions that haven't been uh, addressed, uh, but I think we are on schedule with all of those. Uh, you know, as we draw to the close here, Shazia, uh, I have a, you know, a question for you. So it's rare that one gets to see one's work laid out in the kind of context of, uh, let's call it a mid-career uh, survey. Uh, were you surprised by anything as you walked through the uh, exhibition at the Morgan? Did you see things in your work that you either didn't realize were there or um, had forgotten were there or uh, made you think differently about your work? Yeah, I, every time, and I've been going there <laughs> a lot, every single time I see something, I am, you know, I'm able to embrace it more because there's been a lot of distance. So much of the work I may, I myself just saw in reproductions. I didn't really, I'm seeing it after all the time since I made it. And they, that, that level of uh, ability to, you know, paint in that way and the patience that it demanded and the different level of um, labor and eyesight and all of that, right? So it's like, wow, I did that. So it's, it's a little bit of that, but also I think there are nuggets of ideas that I feel like I, I could have created like an entire, you know, body of work. They, those, those are very much present there. And I think seeing the work together in this way gives me that kind of license that I, sh I who's stopping me? I should go back in and dig those ideas out. And I think the sculpture is very much in that vein because, uh, it, 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 when I was like, if I, I want to do a sculpture, but like, let's start with the protagonist and the ideas that are already in the work and see what happens. Because as soon as you take that little tiny sketch that somebody might not even notice and bring it into a three-dimensional space, so much more dynamics uh, uh, get born. Like the weight of the Devata on the Venus, is she like, pressing her down is the Venus, you know, full of admiration. What is the nature of the relationship? What is the power dynamic? Is that piece, is that pose legible? So to work with models and then to work on that, all of this I think was a, is a, it took the work in a very different dimension. And I see that. So seeing, seeing the old work, you start recognizing um, many such um, chapters and stories that are there. Well, I think you are absolutely remarkable, Shazia. You know that from our many conversations, I admire your honesty, your fearlessness, because it's not just a fearlessness in your art making, it's a fearlessness in the way you live, your willingness to directly engage the most difficult and troubling issues of our time, and to do so with a clarity and honesty that is absolutely remarkable. And I think, I hope that anyone and everyone who was with us tonight heard the power of your voice, the clarity of your thinking, and the determination and courage uh, of your inner being. And I really mean that inner being because I think anyone who knows Shazia knows that she radiates uh, a sense of self-confidence, but not overconfidence, a confidence that she can work the ideas out. And what I, what I discovered uh, in the exhibition uh, was the way in which you can see ideas that are at the beginning of your career, played out, expanded, picked apart, put back together continuously across the breadth of your career. And so it is a truly remarkable achievement. Uh, and I hope all of you, uh, who have seen the show will go back and see it again. And if you haven't seen it yet, rush to the Morgan to see it. Thank you, Shazia, for being with me tonight. Thank you all for having joined us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Glenn, for your time. Really appreciate it. Good evening, everyone.